For those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the elders here. Um, and during the summer, we like to try and give Sean uh, an extended uh, break uh, where he's around. He's here this morning, but uh, the elders come in and we preach consecutive weeks for a few weeks in a row. And so I wanted to kind of take a moment before we started just to kind of recap real quick where we've been and, and where we come from. If you guys are anything like me over the summer, uh, I am in and out and have been gone a few weeks and I'm trying to catch up on the podcast and things like that. I'm actually getting on a plane uh, tomorrow morning to go out to Austin, Texas to see my wife's family and hang out with them for a little bit. And so we've kind of been transient a little bit this summer. So I want to take a minute and just kind of recap where we've been and what we've looked at uh, over the last few weeks of summer. Uh, we've been in Daniel, and for those of you guys that aren't familiar, at the beginning of Daniel, chapter 1, we see Babylon come in and essentially defeat the king of Judah. They come in, and they defeat the king, they take over, and they take back with them some of the young men from uh, Judah. Daniel is one of these young men. He's probably maybe 15 years old, young teenager at this time, and he goes with a group, and they're tasked with this learning the Babylonian culture. He goes and he has to find his way between honoring his God and not becoming a Babylonian, which is exactly what the king wanted at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar, right? And so we've talked about this balance between isolation and assimilation throughout the text. In chapter 2, we saw that Daniel's king, the God of heaven, is the one who reveals mysteries. I believe it was Richard who's who uh, preached this a few weeks back, and we saw that he was able to interpret the dream, and he gives uh, the truth of, of this dream. Daniel ends up saving hundreds of men because of this. In chapter 3, I believe it was uh, Lance who came up and talked about the faithfulness of, of Daniel's friends, the story that we probably all heard and learned when we were little kids, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace, right? We saw the faithfulness that God is mighty, that he is powerful. He is able to control all things and to save them, to rescue them. And last week, Al unpacked King Nebuchadnezzar's kind of rise and fall and then recognition of who God really was. Uh, we ended with Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, in, in this statement from King Nebuchadnezzar, this, this horrible king who recognizes who the true king is, who the true Lord is. If we look at Daniel 4, 37, he says this, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. That's a big, bold statement for a guy who was known for being ruthless and worshiping all these other gods. He's, he is humbled, and he comes before, and he recognizes and honors the one true God. And so as we come to chapter 5 this week, we see the story of Daniel continue, and this is kind of the downfall of, of Babylon at this point. We're starting into the last kind of two chapters of the main story. If you remember at the beginning, Sean talked about how Daniel is broken up into the first six chapters and the last six chapters, and we're getting close to that end of the first six and the story in Babylon's fall. And so we're going to hear, again, maybe a familiar story. There's some familiar statements in this. The writing on the wall, that's still a statement we use at times today. That comes from this passage right here. Uh, there's another one that you've been weighed and measured, and you've been found wanting, right? We still might hear that at times. It's in some classic movies that we've seen and whatnot. And so as we review that, I want to come before God and just pray now as we jump into chapter 5 that God would illuminate the text to us, that he would speak to us. It wouldn't be about us or me or anybody else, but that we'd hear God's words today and that his spirit would speak to us where we need to hear him. And so pray with me. Lord, we love you, uh, God, and we thank you for your word. Even as we just got a chance to talk with the kids and recognize that true faith is being sure of the things that you've written and you've given us. God, we're confident in that. And God, I pray even right now, according to 2 Timothy 4.17, God, that you would stand with me and strengthen me. God, so that your message would be fully preached through me this morning. God, I pray that your words would be given to me so that I would fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel so we would better understand who you are and that we would understand who we are, God, in light of your truth. 
God, we love you and we pray this. We ask you first for you to illuminate your word in this moment. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So our text this morning, I'm going to give you just kind of the the main idea right now. Our text this morning ultimately is going to remind us that God is in control. If you haven't seen that already through all of the stories of Daniel, we're going to see it again today that God is in control. We're also going to see that there's this inevitability of a divine judgment that, that will take place and that does take place. And we're called to a humble reverence before God. God is in control. As I I thought about that, and as we look to even verse 1 here, we see this new king on the scene, King Belshazzar, that we're going to be introduced to. We'll give the background of him here in a minute, and he's not the greatest guy. We'll see that. But before we throw him under the bus, as we reflect on that, being in control for a moment here, God is always in control. The reality is, is we all struggle with being in control. We all want to be in control in some way or some space that we have. We, we struggle with that in our different areas. Um, maybe it's just me. I don't know. I'm a parent. I've got three little boys, and believe me, I struggle with control and wanting to control everything that they're doing. Uh, I'm a teacher, and if you are teachers in here, you know how hard that is to control a classroom and the desire to control that. Um, I'm a coach. Same thing. I coach cross-country. Uh, and saying that we want to control certain things, right? And just about two years ago, I bought a dog, which was a huge mistake. Um, <laughs> yes, this is, hopefully we get more amens than that. But um, I bought this dog. My boys were terrified of dogs, and so I'm going to get a dog to help them not be afraid of dogs, right? And it worked. I was successful. But a dog is, out of all the other things in my life, something I think I should be able to control, right? It's, it's an animal. I should be able to control And so even just this last week, we had invited my parents over for dinner. They just live a few miles up the road. And so we had some extra food, invited them over. They popped in. And as my my dad always does, because he's a grandpa, he shows up with a pan of brownies, you know, right? That's what he does. And so we, we have a nice dinner. We eat, all that kind of stuff. Kids eat their brownies. My wife cuts me a nice big brownie, puts it on the counter, because obviously parents, you don't get to eat when everyone else eats, right? I'm doing the dishes. And so, you know, my parents leave, all that kind of stuff. Brownie's on the counter. My wife's like, watch it. Blue, that's the name of our dog. He'll get it. Watch out for your brownie. I'm like, I I got this. I'm in control, right? I got this. No problem. I'm doing the dishes. I see him. I throw him away a few times. You know, not throw him away. I'm pushing him away nicely, right? No animal abuse here, I promise. Okay? And all of a sudden, when my son asked me for some help for something, literally 20 feet away, walk over. And here's the thing, is, is my dog has an infatuation with napkins. I don't even think he wanted a brownie. He wanted a napkin that it was sitting on. He would eat napkins, paper, anytime. Um, he actually ate a piece of my dad's Bible a couple weeks back. Um, he was hungry for the word, right? A biblical dog. And so I literally, seconds, help my son turn around. I look over, and that brownie is gone. There is not an ounce left of this thing. One crumb sitting on the counter. I am just ticked at this dog. And we'll just end the story there. Um, My (laughs) wife was worried because chocolate. Apparently dogs aren't supposed to eat chocolate, right? He's going to die. And I'm like, if he dies, he dies, right? (laughs) Little Ivan Drago, like, he served his purpose. (laughs) Ate my brownie. If he dies, he dies. We want to be in control. The reality is that we are reminded daily, wherever you are, that we're not in control. But we desire it, and we pursue it, and we seek it over and over and over again. And that's what we're going to see here with Belshazzar and his desire for control. Look with me at Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. We're introduced to him. It says, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. And he drank wine in front of the thousand. And so we just finished with King Nebuchadnezzar, right? And there's something you might miss here in the text. But we're 23 years apart from chapter 4 to chapter 5. There's 23 years in between it, right? If we were during the school year, half of the room would be under 23 years old, right? All these college kids, 23 years is a big gap from chapter 4 to chapter 25, or chapter 4 to chapter 5. It's a big gap. 
we've got many different kings that have come and have gone, and now we have Belshazzar that we don't know a whole lot about. In fact, at this point, Daniel is probably around 80 years old. 80 years old. He's been in captivity almost 65, 66 years. That is a long time. Think of just this old, I want to say old, sorry if you're 80 years old in here. This old, wise man, he's been through it all. He's been through all these kings. He's been around. He's seen it all at this point. And we've got here this new king, Belshazzar, who we're not getting a great view of here in the first thing. He's thrown this huge party. In fact, there's a lot of people for a long time that thought this story was actually made up because Belshazzar didn't exist anywhere in historical records. They couldn't find it. There was no King Belshazzar anywhere in historical records. Like, is this story even real that exists? It's just made up for, for a purpose. What, what's the deal with this? It wasn't actually, I think it was 1854 that archaeologists discovered what's called the Nabonidus Cylinders. And so actually Nabonidus was Belshazzar's father, who was the king. Nabonidus, there's record of, he was king. They found these cylinders, archaeologists did, 1854, that talked about what he was doing. He was dedicating uh, the ziggurat. If you know what that is, want to look it up, go for it. Um, but it mentions Belshazzar. And so the little that we know about him is was he was the son of the king, who was given the authority of the king while his father was away. And there's, there's different speculation as to where he went and why he went in different places. But he's gone for at least 10 years. And we've got his son, who now has his authority of his father in the position in Babylon, in this great city. And what is he doing? He comes across right away in, first one, in verse 1 as this kind of like this, this rich kid, daddy's money, trust fund baby, throwing a party, just living it up. Thousands of people, we're going to read in verse 2, wives, concubines, huge, massive party. He's just partying it up. Most of the commentators say it wasn't just some ordinary party. When you throw in all the people that were there and the fact that he throws in the wives and the concubines, I'll let you throw, connect the dots there. Not, not some ordinary party. This was, this was a big deal, very hedonistic, pursuit of pleasure kind of deal. And we see them drunk and desiring to show how great they are. He's desiring to show how great he is. John Lennox, the author of the book that we've been reading as elders as we go through Daniel, he says this, some have suggested that Belshazzar held this feast to express his confidence that Babylon was impregnable, even though he knew that at the very moment, the armies of his enemy were outside the city. So here they are inside the city. They're throwing this huge party. If you remember back, I think Sean told us this. Babylon, this great city, the walls are 320 feet tall, 80 feet thick. Nobody's getting in here. I don't care if you're outside the door trying to get in and take us over. I'm in control. I'm in the walls. I'm safe. And they throw this huge party because of it. If look at verse 2. It says, Belshazzar, when he had tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, he brought, uh, be brought. The king and his lords, wives, and the concubines might drink from them. And so if we don't remember back in chapter 1, when Nebuchadnezzar takes over, Judah, he goes in, and they take things with them. They take vessels out of the temple, right? Nebuchadnezzar brings them back, and essentially he kind of puts them in like his trophy room. He's got like this trophy room of his gods. It's almost like a museum-esque kind of thing where he sets up all of these idols and things that he's taken from the nations that he's conquered. Well, here, years later, we have Belshazzar, in this drunken party, and he wants to use those. And so he sends for them. The vessels that were meant to be dedicated to God, he asked for to bring and drink out of. I can't even imagine what this would be like. Um, I, I tried to think of an illustration of, of how this might 
B, and honestly, I think this falls way, way short, but I'll, but I'll give it to you anyways. Imagine for a second if, let's say, uh, the Oakland Raiders. I guess they're not the Oakland Raiders anymore. Las, they're always going to be the Oakland Raiders to me. Las Vegas Raiders, and I say this because I'm a fan, sorry. But imagine if that team, that football team, went and stole the Lombardi Trophy, right? The trophy you get for winning the Super Bowl. They stole it from the Kansas City Chiefs. They brought it back, and they're like, we're going to party it up drinking wine out of this thing, getting drunk off of this thing. Imagine how upset everyone would be about that, right? How upset the Kansas City Chiefs would be, the NFL, all sorts of things, right? In some small sense, this is what's happening here. Like here is a vessel that is meant to bring praise and honor and glory to the one true God from the temple of God where the presence of God dwelt and he asked for it to bring and drink and get drunk off of it. I can't even imagine what this would be like. As I was reading through this, it it reminded me of Romans chapter 12. Um, We, again, want to throw Belshazzar under the bus for this, but I, I, I don't think we are too far at times from him. In Romans 12, we read that we are to offer our bodies 12.1, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Every one of us has been given a life created in the image of God for the glory of God. We have been given a body that was gifted to us by God, meant to worship him, to praise him, to bring glory to him, and for us to enjoy in worshiping and glorifying him. And here Paul urges us to offer our bodies as this living sacrifice used for worship to him. But if we're being honest, much like Belshazzar, There's probably many times where we believe and think that our bodies are our own. It's mine. I can do what I want with it. And we don't treat it in such a way that it brings glory to God. In fact, I believe that our culture preaches to us that it's our right to do whatever we want with our bodies. It's ours. It's my body. I can do what I want with it. It's your right. And in the same way, Scripture is calling us back to, no, it is not yours. You are created in the image of God, meant to bring glory and honor to Him. In Romans 12, 3, it says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment. We recognize even in the story of Belshazzar, he was far from sober. He had far from sober judgment in his use of something that was meant to be dedicated to God. And as a side note, I believe fully that we need to be careful that we have sober judgment in the way that we use our lives to bring glory to God. As we go back to to Daniel chapter 5, we look at verse 3 and 4. Let's continue with the story. It says, Then they brought out the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple from the house of God in Jerusalem, And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines, they drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze, iron, wood, and stone. They take the very things meant to be used in the worship of God, and what do they do? They worship other gods with them. I came across Psalms chapter 10 this week in my study And Psalms 10, verse 3 and 4 says this, For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are there is no God. I think that's exactly what we see Belshazzar doing in these moments. As we continue on, we see what happens in verse 5. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared, and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite of the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote, and then the king's color changed, 
and his thoughts alarmed him, and his limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. Here's this man full of pride, thinking he is in control. No one is going to stop me. Let's celebrate. They're outside the walls. Nobody's getting in. Let's drink to that. Let's drink to how great we are. And God intervenes and writes on the wall. And we see what happens oftentimes when people are faced with the presence of God. He is terrified. It says that literally his color changed. His knees knocked. He's shaking. Some commentators went even as far as to say he might have even like wet himself. Like he is terrified. Passing out. Color change. Doesn't know what to do. In Proverbs 11.2, it says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Or Proverbs 29.23, One's pride will bring him low. This is exactly what we see happening here. Belshazzar's pride in this situation of not honoring God and blaspheming God, we see the reality of him being brought low. In verse 7, it says, The king called loudly, to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. And the king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads the writing and shows me inter- its interpretation, they shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Third ruler. Remember, he's, he's second. His dad is actually the real king. Third ruler. I'll, I'll give you this power. It says, Then all the kings and the wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. They were unable to do it. Verse 9, then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. So verse 10, it says, the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. Who is this queen? Most commentators say this is not his wife, because, again, he is not even the true king. He's just been given this authority for a time. It's probably his mom. And so what's happening at this moment? He has changed his color. His knees are knocking. He's about to pass out, essentially. And his mom comes in to save him, because nobody else can, right? Way to go, moms. Yeah, right? Mom comes in. Let me remind you of something, is what she tells him. She says in verse 11, There's a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of, is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, because an excellent spirit of knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. And so she puts before him this man, Daniel, that we know, we've seen, came in as maybe a 15-year-old kid, and he's been faithful through all of this, not isolating himself, just hiding in a hole, hoping for it to be over, not assimilating and just becoming a Babylonian, but he is faithful to God in the places that God has given him influence. He served the kings. He saved people's lives. And they remember now and they call him. There's something kind of interesting here that I think is just kind of ironic, the, the play on words here that's happening with, with the names. We've got Daniel, who the queen just said, who the king called Belteshazzar. Right? It's going to be hard to follow for a second. Belteshazzar. We've got King Belshazzar. They sound real similar, right? Said, so, But they called him Daniel. And so when you look at the words, what, what do these names actually mean? It's, it's kind of interesting. King Belshazzar literally means Baal protect the king. It's this plea for this other god to protect the king. That's what his name means. Belteshazzar, the name that was given to Daniel, the Babylonian name given to Daniel, is Our Lady protect the king. Okay, again, to a cry out for this female goddess to protect the king. The name Daniel means God is my judge. 
God is my judge. What's about to happen in this moment? God is going to judge him. And you're going to see that Belshazzar actually refers to him by his name Daniel instead of Belteshazzar. I don't know if that, it's like Bible nerd stuff. I think it's kind of cool. So sorry, bear with me on that. Let's look at it. Verse 13. It says, then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, who the king, my father, brought from Judah. Even in this moment of humiliation where he is terrified before God, he wants to push others below him. He's reminding him, oh yeah, you're that guy. You're that guy that we captured. You're the exile that we captured and brought in. Right, that we defeated one of those exiles. You're one of those guys. Right? I read this quote from C.S. Lewis this week on uh, his book, Mere Christianity. He says, A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. A proud man is always looking down on people, but as long as you are looking down, you cannot see what is above you. And we see the reality of this, the pride of Belshazzar, even in this moment, as he is being brought low, he's still trying to look down on Daniel, who is going to bring the statement of judgment on him. So if I summarize the next section here, we have essentially Daniel responding to him right? He's asking and he's saying, or Belshazzar is asking, he's saying, I've heard the spirit of God is in you. Help me to understand what is this. No other wise man has been able to interpret this. If you can do it, I will clothe you with purple and gold and make you third in charge. And Daniel's like, I don't want any of that. I've been there before. I don't need that, but I'm going to tell you what it says anyways. And so Daniel begins to give the interpretation in verse 18. He says, O king most high, <clears throat> Sorry, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory. Don't, don't miss that. The most high God gave King Nebuchadnezzar kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of all the greatness that he gave him, all the peoples and the nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened, so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. This is the story that that Al read to us last week. Get this here. At the end of 21, it says, until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. Until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdoms of mankind and sets over it whom he will. There's two questions that I ask myself every day when I'm reading my Bible just to kind of help me um, focus and and get something out of it. I don't know if you guys have ever been there before you read your Bible, you leave, and you're like, I don't even remember what I read, right? So I ask myself these two questions. One of them is this, what can I learn about who God is? What can I learn about who God is? Well, here's our answer right here. The most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. God is in control not us. God is in control. Do we believe that? That's what his word is saying over and over again. In verse 23, the end of verse 23, we read, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. What can we learn about God? He is in control of all things, of all kingdoms. He holds our breath in his hand. That's the God that we believe in. That's the God that we serve. The reality is we live in a culture of fear. We are driven by fear. Fear of missing out on things, small things, little things. Fear of who's in charge or who might be in charge. We have fear that often drives us. And as Christians, we need to be reminded that God, the most high God, is in control. That he is the one 
who puts people in positions of power and removes them. That He is the one who brings them low and lifts them up. Do we trust that? Do we believe it? The second question that I ask myself is, what can I learn about mankind? What can I learn about myself? What is true about us? If we go back up to verse 22, it says this, And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. Though you knew all these things about Nebuchadnezzar, you chose not to humble yourself. You chose not to believe in it. John Lennox says, Belshazzar knew about the transformation of Nebuchadnezzar's life, and he had chosen to publicly insult and dishonor the God who had been responsible for it. In an act of suicidal defiance, Belshazzar had decided to use God's sacred vessels in the service of the very idolatry that he knew God hated. His own pleasures and desires were his supreme values. Sound like anything today in our culture? His own pleasures and desires were his supreme values. And we can easily fall into that as well, assimilate into our own culture if we're not careful to recognize that with greater knowledge comes greater responsibility. Create, you know, quote Spider-Man up here, okay? Okay. There's a reality to that in Scripture. It starts here. You knew it and you didn't respond. Okay, Luke 12, 48 comes from there as well. In Luke 12, it says, But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating, he will receive a light beating. But everyone to whom much was given of much of him will be required. And from him whom they entrusted much, they will be demanded more. And so the question for us is, what are we doing with the knowledge that God has given us? Some of us in the room might be brand new Christians. Some of us might not be Christians at all, might not have a whole lot of knowledge of God. Maybe you got brought here by somebody else today. Some of you guys have been here since the cradle, and you have a lot of knowledge. I work at a school, a Christian school, and teach Bible to kids, some of which have been there their entire life. They have a lot of knowledge. What are we doing with it is the question. We have a responsibility to respond to the knowledge that we've been given. Are we allowing us, allowing that knowledge to transform us, to live and walk in the truth of God's word? Do we trust it? Do we believe that it is good? I was reading Psalm 119 this week, and and if you get a chance this week, go and read Psalm 119, recognizing that God's truth is good. His ways are good. They are not just right. They are right and good. It's good for you. Do we believe it? Do we trust it? Do we walk in it? If we flip over to Romans chapter 1, I want to show you guys something here. I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but in Romans chapter 1, we see this picture of a similar thing happening in verse 18 to 25. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known of how God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was to be forever blessed. Amen. I believe that's the exact story that we have here with Belshazzar. He is worshiping himself and the creation instead of the creator, the most high God. If we go back to Daniel chapter 5 and and finish up by looking at this very judgment, Daniel's unpacking of what was written on the wall. 
if we go to verse 24, We read, then from his presence, the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Many, many, tekel, perison. This is the interpretation of the matter. Many, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and been found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Here's the interpretation. Daniel shows up, says, you've been judged. God is your judge, right? Your days have been numbered. You've been weighed and found wanting. Your kingdom's going to be divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Here's the thing. The Medes and the Persians were the ones outside the walls in that moment. In fact, they probably weren't even outside the walls in that moment. They might have already been inside because what they did, genius, they diverted. If you remember all the way back to chapter 1, Sean showed us a video, right? Babylon, amazing, beautiful garden city. This river's flowing through it, Euphrates River, right? Well, what do they do? They diverted the river so that the water level goes down. They walk straight in to Babylon through the riverbed. As everybody's in a drunken stupor, the army walks in and defeats them. We see it. At the end of the chapter here, verse 29, first, it says, Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed in purple, and a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. I'm sure Daniel's super excited about this. The kingdom is going to be destroyed. All right, yes, you're third in, in charge. And he's like, thanks, appreciate it. I don't know if you guys have ever been to um, Texas Roadhouse. This just brought this to my mind. super random. But... Um, Think it, like if it's your birthday at Texas Roadhouse, you never want to go there, okay? Unless you like attention, you want to go there. But introverts never go there. They bring out a saddle. They make you sit on a saddle, and all the waiters come around and start singing this song. It's not even Happy Birthday. It's some other weird song. Everyone in the restaurant is like clapping, and like, if you look at the people sitting on that saddle, they just got this like <laughs> blank stare of like, I hate my life right now. I know it's my birthday. I'm supposed to enjoy this, and I don't, right? At least that would be me, okay? That is my picture of Daniel in this moment. He's putting this, this robe on him, and he's just like, really? I just told you you're going to be defeated. You're going to die, and you're putting a robe on me. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right, awesome. Verse 30, look, there it is. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Again, Proverbs is full of this. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Belshazzar fell that night because of his pride and arrogance. The question for us today is that do we recognize that, that our days are numbered? That in the same way, we will be weighed and measured. The Bible is clear of that. This is not just Belshazzar, this horrible person. How will we stand before God? Will we be found wanting? The reality is that we have a hope, going back to what we told our kids, we have a hope that we will stand before God righteous because of Jesus, not because of ourselves. Because of what Jesus did on the cross in his death and burial and resurrection, we will not be found wanting if we put our trust and our faith in him. Ephesians 2, a verse many of us know, 2, 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Is your faith in him? Do you trust him? Romans 10, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you believe that? Are you walking in a way that brings honor and glory to God? Do you recognize that God is in control and that we bow and we worship him? That's what we come to do together each week at Pella Communities. And that's my hope for you guys. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for your word, for your truth, for the fact that we can come and we can learn and be fed by your spirit. And God, I pray that we would take a moment even now just to look at our lives 
the pride in our own lives, the control in our own lives, and that we would give that to you. God, lay it before your feet, that we would trust and have faith in Jesus to forgive us of all sins and to walk in the righteousness and newness of life that you give us through him. God, we love you and praise you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.